This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Be seated. Our scriptural lesson for today is coming from 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 15 through 20. You'll notice there these words in the New Living Translation. After Nathan returned to his home, the Lord sent a deadly illness to the child of David and Uriah's wife. David begged God to spare the child. He went without food and lay all night on the bare ground. The elders of his household pleaded with him to get up and eat with them, but he refused. And then on the seventh day, the child died. And David's advisors were afraid to tell him. He wouldn't listen to reason while the child was ill, they said. What drastic thing will he do when we tell him the child is dead? And when David saw them whispering, he realized what had happened. Is the child dead, he asked. Yes, they replied, he's dead. And then David got up from the ground, washed himself, put on lotions and changed his clothes. And he went to the tabernacle and worshiped the Lord. And after that, he returned to the palace and was served food and ate. I'm speaking today from the subject simply moving on, moving on. This is David. You know that this child of David and Bathsheba that died died because the child was conceived the wrong way. It was an illegal arrangement. David had gotten himself in an entanglement that God was not pleased with at all. And the fruit of David's sin had to die. Uh, one way that we know that God did not acknowledge the legitimacy of their marriage, which had come through an ill-gotten way by having the husband clandestinely put to death. Uh, notice the scripture says that after Nathan returned to his home, the Lord sent, the Lord sent the deadly illness to the child of David and Uriah's wife. It didn't say David's wife. It said Uriah's wife. See, God knew the sin that had been committed and how they tried to cover the blood, even though it wasn't on his hand, it came from his heart. And so he was guilty of it. And he begged God, he begged God, God, don't let my child die. Don't let my child die. Don't let my child die. But to whom do you appeal when God is the one who's sending trouble? God has a purpose in it. And he's working something that will ultimately be for David's good. And what I want you to understand is that if you've done something wrong and if judgment comes for it, if, if, if uh, retribution comes uh, from it, and now you're praying and God has built it into the system or God has sent something, a penalty your way, and you're asking God for, uh, to, to be excused from consequences, uh, please understand that when God has willed something to happen in your life, God's will cannot be prayed away by human beings because prayer never changes the will of God. Prayer only facilitates God's will. You pray to bring God's will in the earth. We, Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So he never taught us to pray against the will of God. Just as a note, praying against God's will never works. 
You can't change God's mind. He's omniscient. He's already thought of whatever you were going to try to talk him out of. So you can't really change the mind of God. God is God. The scripture says, God says, I change not. Because he's so thorough. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is consistent. God is a God who operates by principle. So he's not fickle. He's not changing. He's not shifting one uh, minute, one day, and another thing, another. He didn't react out of an emotion. God is a God that, that dealt with the principles that he had already laid in, in his word. So God knows things that we don't know. And remember that even though what you might go through might be painful, it's still for your good. And God will, will use uncomfortable situations, painful situations, storms to help to develop our character in him. He has a purpose in it all. He makes us better through it if we'll keep our hearts right and trust him in the process. It's, it's just uh, about that. Smooth seas never made good sailors. I, I, I love something that C.S. Lewis said. He said, hardships often prepare ordinary people for an extraordinary destiny. Hardships often prepare ordinary people for an extraordinary destiny. You look at anybody who has an extraordinary destiny, I promise you that they've been through something. They paid a price to be where they are. And you're looking at them and said, ooh, I wish this, I wish that, I wish the other. You don't know the price that they had to pay for what they have and of where they are. The sacrifices that had to be made to be where they are. We want the results, but we don't necessarily want the process and the sacrifice in order to get it. And now, when it appears that, uh, that David rebounded rather quickly from his loss, because you see, remember when he found out that the child was sick, I mean, for a whole week, I mean, he's, he's in sackcloth and ashes, and, uh, and he's trying to repent, and he's pleading with God, God, please don't let my child die. Please don't let my child die. Please don't let my child die. And then when they finally told him the child is dead, I mean, he, he noticed the child was dead. You know, they, they were whispering something was suspicious about it. And so the Bible says he just, he, he got up and he moved on. But it, it, it wasn't as quickly as you may think. Change is a process, not an event. Change is a process, not an event. Change is a process, not an event. It's a process. You go through a process of changing. Change is, a, is about a metamorphosis that happens in your life. You are changing over time. And, and here's what I want you to realize. There are some people that based on what died in their life, it could have been a relationship that died. It could have been a business that died. It could have been a dream that died. But oftentimes, our prison is not a place. Our prison is a perspective. It is a mindset. And what locks most people into their prison is a perspective. It is a mindset. It's how they think about something. It's how something made them feel. They are locked into something because of of a perspective or a mindset. And so this is why the transformational power has to now come in David's life because change is not an event, it's a process and he needs to be processed through this. He grieved for a whole week, seven days on the ground. He's crying out to God. He's going through process. It hurts when something that you love is dying, that you're losing something that you deeply care about. You're, you're having a hissy fit with God saying, Lord, don't, let, don't take this away from me. I love this. Don't take this away from me. And God is saying, if I don't take this away from you, I'll make you think that what you did is okay. And I'm going to develop your character, David, through this. I love you, David, but I'm going to make you better as a result of this. You've got a good life, but I'm going to make that life even better. And it may not feel good right now, and you may not understand what I'm doing nor why I'm doing it. But if you'll just hang with me, David, I'll show you that things will work out for your good. And, and it did. It, it, it eventually worked out for his good. 
But I want you to understand, just by looking at this life and this whole process of what happened with David and his losing his child, I want you to see that you will go through uh, a few phases whenever you break up with your past. Whenever you break up with your past, whenever you lose something that was dear to you, whether it was a dream, whether it was a relationship, uh, whether it was some uh, business that you, that you birthed or, or organization, some kind of ministry, whatever it is, you, you will go through a few phases whenever you break up with your past. And whatever it is that is hanging over you that sometimes becomes your prison because there are people that get stuck in a past relationship. Stuck in what somebody said to them in a past relationship. You know, if, if I leave you, ain't nobody going to want you. And, and, and then that becomes somebody's mantra in their own mind. And they're hearing this over and over again. And, and they can't move on from that. Uh, let me walk you through quickly just the, 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 the phases. So phase one is emotional turmoil emotional turmoil. And, and this, uh, this phase is deeply emotionally charged. When you are processing through a loss in your life, you may experience tears and anger and anxiety and sadness and thoughts of taking revenge and all kinds of stress, all kinds of feelings of regret. You go through emotional turmoil. If you had a breakup of a relationship, if you've had a, a severance of a relationship with a family member, a friend, a job that you loved, whatever it is, moving from a, a city, uh, you're going to experience tears and fears and, and sadness and, and all kinds of thoughts of, of uh, taking revenge. But emotions are normal. When things happen to you, emotions are normal. Now, let me give you a piece of advice here. Express those emotions in a safe place with safe people. Say safe place. That, listen, when, whenever you're, you're, you're wounded, you don't expose wounds to just all kinds of germs. You need to be in a safe place with safe people. If you get hurt, the internet, trust me, is not a safe place. Because... Some of the people that check on you and ask you how you're doing are not really concerned about you. They're just nosy. And they want to they have some stuff to talk about, to gossip about with someone else. So when you're going through turmoil and you're hurting, find a safe place with safe people that can help you to process your emotions. You don't have to be crying all day at work and every place you go, you send them in a coffee shop crying. Listen, find a safe place with safe people and cry your eyeballs out. Feelings can be painful, but the truth of the matter is they will pass. And uh, you might need to block access to certain things because sometimes if you're going back to your ex's social media page, you're going to see some happy pictures of you all together or whatever, and, and it may trigger some things. And now you're all into your feelings all over again. So while you're being processed through an emotional situation, block that. You, I mean, you have to protect yourself. I mean, have you ever noticed that if you, if you stump your toe, you hurt your foot, you have to watch where you step. Because it looks like everything is trying to attack that hurt foot. The hurt leg, the hurt shoulder, the hurt arm. I mean, it's just, it's like it becomes magnetic to stuff. So you have to protect whatever is hurt while it heals. That's why they put splinters on things so that you don't re-injure something in the process of trying to heal. That's why you need a safe place with safe people. A safe place with safe people. So phase one is emotional turmoil. Somebody dies, you lose something, you break up with somebody. There is emotional turmoil. That's normal. Find a safe place with safe people. Phase two is adjustment. Adjustment. You're getting adjusted. You adjust to life outside of the old relationship. Whatever it is from your past. You have to break up with your past. 
You have to move on. You adjust to life outside the old relationship. And so you have to find new ways to be able to, to relax and then to even enjoy yourself. And you have to keep structure around your time. If you break up in a relationship, you're most vulnerable oftentimes whenever you did your dating, whenever your date night used to be. It may be the weekend. And so now you've got to create some new routines for yourself of where you're improving yourself on the weekend. It has nothing to do with the other uh, past. You, you're creating, you're adjusting to a new reality. It's an adjustment. That's phase two. Phase three is self-doubt. Self-doubt. You go through self-doubt when you're trying to break up with your past. You're coming into a place of self-doubt. Now, when you're in self-doubt, you're wondering, you know, did, did, I, did I do the right thing? Maybe, maybe had I been a little more understanding. Maybe had I been more patient. Maybe had I worked on this and had, had I worked on that. You start uh, thinking about different things. But think about the good things that you brought to the relationship in your past. Whenever you're going through self-doubt, think about the good things that you brought to the relationship in your past. So, because your emotions may have settled, but now your insecurities begin to bubble up from underneath. And you start asking questions, self-doubt, will anybody else ever want me? Will I ever find love again? You know, am I ever going to, you know, to meet the right one? Am I going to be on my own alone forever? You start going through the self-doubt. That's a normal phase of being processed out of the pain of, your, of, 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 of the loss of your past. Phase four is acceptance. And this is where you begin to accept life as it is now. Acceptance, acceptance, acceptance. Emotions can still catch you off guard, but this is where you begin to accept life as it is now. When you get into this place of acceptance, reality sets in, and now you, 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 you get to a place where I don't care what my ex is doing. I don't have time to be, you know, driving by your house to see whose car is in front of it. I have a life. I'm not going to stress myself over what I have no power to control. I, I, you know, that's who you are. I mean, when people show you who they are, believe them. Accept it. It's, it may be a hard pill to swallow. That's who you are, but I deal with that. And I'm not going to be running behind you like a private investigator. You, you're, you're inviting harm to your own soul when you do that. Here's phase five, growth. See, when you process yourself through pain, you actually end up growing. I mean, this is the place where you, you've learned about a lot about yourself and you're finally able to forgive the wrongs that you've done or that were done to you. And, uh, and then you find yourself strengthened as a person. In this growth stage, you are better and wiser than before. You are better and wiser than before. I mean, that's why Maya Angelou said, I wouldn't take nothing from a journey. Because it might not have been an easy, smooth journey, but it was the trouble, it was the roughness in the journey that developed the person, that taught them how to pray, that taught them how to depend upon the Lord, that taught them how to trust in Jesus in times of uncertainty. But I want you to see here from the scriptures that after uh, David dealt with this devastating loss in his life, he didn't stay there. He moved on. He didn't stay there. He moved on. After David messed up, he followed this strategy. And I want us to just walk through the biblical story here to pull out of here. We're going to just exegete out what uh, David did that helped him through the process. Here, here's the first thing that happened. He looked up. So look up. Look up. It's the first strategy. David employed this strategy. He looked up. So look up. The moment that you've been down, down over what you lost, down over what has changed, down over what didn't meet the reality that you expected, the, the ideal that you had in your mind, whenever you're down, look up, look up, just Look up. See, the Bible said, and we know that he looked up because the scripture said there in verse 19 that when David saw, saw them whispering, remember he was, he was face down on the ground. 
But he saw them whispering. He's on the ground and he saw them whispering. He realized what had happened. The only reason that he saw them is because he was looking up. He was down, but he was looking up. The first key is when you're going through uh, something that is, that is painful in your life, look up. Look up. Look for the bright side. Look on the bright side. And they, and they asked him, you know, is the child dead? And then they confirmed his suspicion. But we know that he, he did that because he looked up. He looked up. Looking up gets your hope up. Looking up gets your hope up. Looking up, it gets your hope up. So even if you're down and there's nothing else that you can do, just look up. That's step one. Just look up. Look up. Find something that you can hope in. Find a hope. Find a hope. If you're down, look for the hope in the situation. We are never hopeless. We're never hopeless. There's a hope for a better a better day, for a better reality, a better future. Uh, trouble doesn't last always. Thank God that joy does come in the morning. We have that blessed hope. You know, have you ever been not feeling well and you took something at night to try to help you feel better and, and you say, oh, uh, I can't wait till morning comes. I'm going to feel better in the morning. When this passes, I, I'm going to be better. That's a hope. If you're down, look up. This first thing, just look up, just look up, just look up, just look up. Here's the second thing that he did, get up. Because David got up. The Bible says that he got up. He got up from the ground. Verse 20 says that he, then David got up from the ground. Get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. In, in other words here, reposition yourself. You have to reposition yourself for where you want to go. Don't sit there and sulk over what happened to you. Reposition yourself. You lose a job, reposition your, yourself. Repositioning yourself is about retooling yourself. It is about using the relationships that you have, the connections that you have, praying. It's getting a new attitude about yourself. You are repositioning yourself. Sometimes it's moving to another city. That's a part of repositioning yourself. Instead of staying down in the same position, sulking because depression makes you want to stay where you are. It locks you in a prison. You're not in a prison, though. It is a perspective that things are going to always be this way. Look up and then get up. Then get up. I love it. A little uh, tagline that Bishop Jake's daughter, Cora, says in all of her, in her, her social media things. She says, don't give up, get up. Don't give up, get up. Don't give up, get up. And every time that you're, you're, you're on the right road and, and things are difficult, don't give up, get up. Remember that. And if any of you all have seen any of my billboards around town, keep looking up, keep looking up, keep looking up, keep looking up because you have a tendency to move in the direction in which you look. If you keep looking back, you end up going back. Lot's wife looked back. She didn't just look back. After she looked back, she went back because when you look, you start longing. And that's why it's so important about the direction in which you look. So you have to look up and then you get up. You look up and then you get up. This is a process that David went through. David was on the ground for seven days in sackcloth and ashes, mourning, pleading with God. And he looked up and then he got up. Then he got up. And if you can look up, you can get up. Just, just look at it. Just look at it. Just look at it. Get something on the next level and look at it. Just look at it. You know, look at somebody who's already where you want to be. Just look at it. And say, Lord, that, that's where I'm going. That's where I'm going. That's where I'm going. If you've gotten out of shape, go back to your college pictures, your high school pictures, wherever you had the shape. <laughs> go back to that. Just look at it. Look at it. And say, girl, I'm coming for you. I'm coming after you. I'm, you come, come, on, come on back here. Call her out. That fine girl is in there. She just covered up. That's all. Call her out. But you have to reposition yourself because a single act of courage, just a single act of courage can be the tipping point for something extraordinary in your life. I mean, 
If you're going to have faith, faith requires that you take a step. Remember the woman that had the issue of blood for 12 years and she said, if I may but touch the hem of his garment. And she came in the, in the press behind. She took a step. She took a step of faith. She took a step of faith. If you keep saying that you have faith, where's your step? She took a step. She changed her position. She repositioned herself. Had she been at home just wondering and said, you know, I wish somebody would come by me and see about me and did this. No, no, no. She took a step. She took a step, a step of faith. She got up. She got up as an act of her faith. She got up and she took a step to press to get to Jesus and to touch him. She took a step. She took a step. And just remember, God can only bless what you'll do. Psalm chapter 1 talks about that. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. God can only bless what you are willing to do. That's why you got to bust a move. Don't just look up. Get up. Get up. Get up. Take a step. Bust a move. Bust a move. Here's the third thing. Wash up. Wash up. The Bible says there in verse 20, Then David got up from the ground and washed himself. He washed himself. Wash up. Look up. Get up. Wash up. Look up. Get up. Wash up. Wash up. He ridded himself of the guilt. He ridded himself of the shame. He ridded himself of toxic negative emotions. That little negative voice that said, you know, you can't do anything right. You know, that's why they left you anyway. He washed himself. He ridded himself of the dirt. He ridded himself of the foul odors. Sometimes a foul odor is a bad attitude. You know, bad attitudes stink. He washed himself. He washed himself. He washed himself. And uh, I love something that Joseph Campbell says. He says, we must be willing to let go of the life we planned so as to have the life that is waiting for us. You have to be willing to let go of the life that you planned so that you can have the life that is waiting for you. He had to let go the life that was birthed in sin, what was born in sin had to die so that he could have the life that was waiting for him because better was waiting for him. And uh, so he had, to, he had to wash himself. He had to just get some things out of himself. Plato said that there are two things uh, that a person should never be angry at. What they can help and what they cannot. Because anger is a negative emotion that doesn't do anything but makes the person who carries it miserable. So let it go. You're angry over what they did. You're angry over how they left you. Angry, but angry. Anger has no positive fruit when you dwell on it. Uh, you, you, you know, if you're going to be angry, be angry only for a moment. Put a time limit on anger. And say what you need to say and then be finished with it. Wash yourself of it. Wash yourself. David washed himself. He, he looked up. He got up and he washed up. He washed up. Because staying angry about an issue only prolongs that issue in your life and makes your life more miserable in the process. So wash up. Wash up. Look up. Get up. Wash up. Number four, anoint up. Anoint up. The King James Version uh, of this particular chapter in the second chapter, uh, Samuel chapter 12 and verse 20 says, Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself. Anointed himself. Uh, uh, in other words, he put on ointments or the New Living Translation says lotions. But there's a reason that you anoint yourself. You anoint yourself so you don't look like what you've been through. But let, let me say it to you this way. Don't wear what you've been through on your face. Everybody shouldn't be able to look at you. I, I, you know, if, I, if you work in a breakfast restaurant, when I come in, I don't want to be able to see on your face that you and your, your mate, your partner had a fight last night. I, I'm just trying to have breakfast. I, I don't want to see that. Please don't bring that to the table. Don't serve me your attitude and your disgust and your frustration. I didn't come in there for that. You know, I, I, you know, I, I, you know, 
get up and anoint yourself. Anoint yourself. Put some oil on you. Don't, don't look like what you've been through. You don't have to show all of that to the world because they're not going to do anything but talk about it. Girl, you know, she, she sure look bad. She must be going through something. Don't wash yourself. I mean, look up, get up, wash up, and anoint up. Put your, arch your eyebrows. I'm telling you, whatever you need to do to make yourself, I mean, whatever, whatever you need to do, whatever you need to do. You, you can be really hurting on the inside, but, but just don't, don't carry it with you because then you'll invite people into your pity party. And then they'll start talking about it and opening up your hurt all over again. I'm not talking about trying to be fake. I'm trying to, talking about how to get healed. I mean, when I come out, if I've got a, if I've got a sore, an infection, if I've had surgery, you're not going to see my marks. That's going to be a bandage over it. And if I can put some clothing over it, I'm going to do that too because I don't want every, to, every 20 feet that I go to somebody, well, what happened? What happened? And now you got to rehash the whole story and now I am get hurt and start crying and I cried with Mary and I cried with Sue and then I cried with John and I cried with Billy and then I called Mama and cried and called my sister and cried. And, and, and you, you, you're emotionally exhausted. Anoint yourself. Anoint yourself. Anoint yourself. Remember, find a safe place with safe people. You anoint yourself. Don't look like you've been through what you've been through. There's a time to be able to dry your tears and to say, God, I am have to anoint myself. I don't have anybody else to come in here and lay hands and anoint me. Anoint yourself in the name of Jesus. Anoint yourself. Be the priest of your own vessel there and anoint yourself in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Jesus be a, be a shield all about me. Be my rock. Be my healer. And in the name, anoint yourself. Speak that word. Speak that word over you. Speak that word. Arise and shine for thy light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Anoint yourself. Anoint yourself. David anointed himself. He, 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 he looked up. He got up. He washed up. Because you don't want to anoint anything that's dirty. That's why God doesn't anoint flesh. The anointing always came on the garment. It came on the garment. Because flesh can't fully be sanctified. No matter how much you wash it. So the anointing came on the cloth. The clothing. It ran on the clothing of the person because God doesn't anoint flesh. It's not the flesh. It's the spirit of the man. The fifth thing, dress up. David changed his clothes. 2 Samuel 12, 20, David changed his clothes. Remember, he was in mourning clothes. When they were mourning about something and, and imploring the Lord with fasting and all of that, they... They would have on sackcloth and ashes. He took off his mourning clothes and put on his reigning clothes. R-E-I-G-N, reigning clothes. He's a king, remember? He's a king. Kings rule and reign on their throne. He changed his clothes. He changed his clothes. He changed his clothes. I want you to notice the importance of, of, of changing your clothes. John chapter 11, verse 44. Notice, this is the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Jesus raised them, but you need community to help you change your clothes. Take off his grave's clothes, his grave clothes. Take off his grave clothes and let him go. May I tell you what grave clothes are? Grave clothes represent the things that you used to do when you were spiritually dead. Grave clothes, they represent the things that you used to do when you were spiritually dead. Grave clothes represent addictions and worldly things that we hold on to. Take off your, the grave clothes. Grave clothes represent things in your past that keep you from growing and becoming more like Christ. Take off your grave clothes. And uh, David had on grave clothes. He had on mourning clothes. He had to change his clothes. I mean, this is not deep. It's, it's not complicated. 
it's, it's simple, but not everything that's simple is easy. So remember, he, he, he looks up, he gets up, he washes up, he anoints up, and then he dresses up. Now, and, and you can put them in your own term. You know, if you want to say wash up, you know, you can say take a shower, take a bath, and anoint up. You, you know, you lotion down. You know, and then they're dressed up. You, 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 you're dressed up. He, he changed his clothes. He changed his clothes. But notice what the Bible talks about. Isaiah chapter 61 verse 3. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion. To give unto them beauty for ashes. Beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning. And then notice this. The garment. Garment. That's the different clothes. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. God says, I want you to. Take off those mourning clothes. Put on the garment of praise. Put on the garment of praise for that depression that you're dealing with. Just get up in the morning and praise him. Uh, the, uh, praise has nothing to do with how you feel. It, 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 you know, we don't praise God because we feel like praising God. We praise God because God is worthy of our praise. He was worthy before you got here. While you're here, he'll be worthy after you're gone. He's still worthy. He's worthy. And that reassures us in the greatness of God. It, it, is, it reestablishes our faith when you praise God. Something wakes up on the inside of you. I mean, you praise God and it, 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 it's hard to stay in a negative place while you're praising God. Somehow you get a backsplash of just feeling better and lifted when you get into praising God. It shifts your focus off of your problem to the problem solving. When you begin to praise God, you begin to think more about the healer than you do the sickness. You begin to think more about the one that has the power to restore you and to bring you back than you do the setback. I'm just telling you that when you praise him, Something gets up in your faith. You begin to come alive to God. But David changed his clothes. He changed his clothes. And so you have to change your clothes. So don't wear. Don't wear what you've been through. Change your clothes. Change your clothes. The sixth thing that David did after he changed his clothes, then he worshiped up. Worship up. Worship up. Worship up. Second Samuel chapter 12 verse 20. After he got up from the ground and washed himself and put on lotions and changed his clothes, the Bible says he went to the tabernacle and worshiped. He went to the tabernacle and worshiped. Now, I want you to think about this. David is a king. He's got the baddest house in all of Israel. He lives in a palace, but he knows that the palace that he lives is not the tabernacle of the Lord. No matter how fine it is, it is not Bethel. It's not the house of God. There is a power in coming to God's house. I'm just, there, there, there is. There is. After David went through all of that, after he got up off the ground, he looked up and he got up and he washed up and he anointed up. And after he changed his clothes, David went to the tabernacle and worshiped the Lord. Nothing positive had happened for him. And he worshiped God because God was worthy. God is still worthy even in your, in your sorrow. He's still worthy. He's still worthy. But he worshiped God. Even when he had experienced hurt and loss, he still found it within himself to worship God because I think it shifted his focus in his whole praising, his changing his clothes as to what he had left. He still had a beautiful palace. He still had a wife. He still had a future ahead of him. He was young. His future, his whole life was ahead of him. And he was mourning over his first child that he'd lost. And uh, here's what, you know, the Bible talks about in, in Genesis chapter 28, how David, uh, I mean, how uh, Jacob found the stairway to heaven, so to speak. And he called that place Bethel, the house of God. It is different from a palace. Genesis 28 and verse 16 through 19, notice, when Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone 
that he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called that place Bethel, which means house of God, though the city used to be called Luz. He got up and went to the house of God and worshiped. That was number six. And number seven, the seventh thing that David did in being able to move on from his grief, to move on from his loss, to move on from his mistake, from the failure, from the sin that was in his life. As he moved on, the seventh thing that he did was to eat up. Second Samuel 12, 20 says this, and after that, he returned to the palace. After he came back from worshiping, he returned to the palace and was served food and ate because he had been fasting for seven days, refusing to eat. Because grief has a way of taking away your appetite. Grief can rob your appetite, but now he's in recovery. And recovery involves eating healthily in order to restore what has been lost. And here's what I'd say to you. When you've experienced a loss, rise up and feed yourself for where you're going. Feed yourself for where you're going. Feed yourself mentally or intellectually for where you're going. Feed yourself spiritually for where you're going. Feed yourself financially for where you're going. Feed yourself, uh, you know, in all of these different places. Feed yourself relationally for where you're going. There are some folks that you live with. There are some folks you play with. And for where you're going, you're not trying to take playmates. <laughs> Feed yourself for where you are, where you're going. What's feeding your spirit? What are you feeding your body? What kind of relationships are you inviting into your life that feed you spiritually? that feeds you emotionally, that give you a place of connection. And you have to realize this, champions eat differently than other folks. Champions eat differently. And one of the things that I really want you to understand is this. David didn't just get up from a loss and move from his loss. He got up and moved with his loss because when you have something in somebody in your life that you really love though they died though that relationship ended it doesn't mean that your love for them ended you still carry them with you if you love somebody and they their loss in your life you don't just move from that you move with them you carry them in your thoughts in your memories and just to even let you know that that is true once you go through the so-called healing process some days just out of the clear blue a thought will hit you you'll have a flashback and you'll be in tears all over again but I thought I buried them I thought that was over you don't just merely move from something that you love, you move, you move with them. If you've lost a mother or a father, you didn't just move from them, you move, you carry them with you. You carry everything that you've been through with you. You learn from it. You're strengthened by the memory of their presence. The good times that you had together. The things they taught you, how you grew together, how they made you a better person, how you added value to their life. You carry that with you. Nobody can take that away. What has the ability to separate you from the love of God? Not even death. You don't just move from it. You move with it. You say, I've had a loss. David never forgot that. It kept him humble. The pain of that made David where well, he didn't ever want to have that kind of arrangement ever again in his life. And to what we have from Scripture, he never went back to that. He never went to a relationship like that that was out of order. It had to hurt with such a pain. He carried that 
He lived with that the rest of his life. It didn't mean that it made him a victim. It made him wise. It made him strong. It made him a man of integrity after God's own heart. It didn't locate him in a sin. He wasn't defined by the sin of that adulterous relationship. David was known as a man after God's own heart. You know why? Because he didn't define himself where he fell. He kept moving. He got up. He got up. He got up. But he didn't get up and act as though nothing happened. He went through process. He looked up. And he got up. And he washed up. And he anointed up. And he dressed up. And he worshiped up. And then he ate up and fed himself for where he was going. The only reason that he ate was because he was going somewhere. He was going somewhere. He was on a journey. He, he kept moving, moving on, moving on. How do you move on from what has happened? You walk through those same simple steps that David walked through. It's a pattern. And it will work for you. And I want you to see here in Luke chapter 9 and verse 56. Jesus had been in a city and he could do no mighty works there, the Bible says. And then verse 56 says, and they went to another village. Jesus kept moving. He was rejected there. He didn't spend time mourning over it, trying to convince those folks. He just simply went to another village. He went to another village. He went to another village. Don't sit. Whatever sit goes bad. I've taught you that. Whatever sit, whatever sits goes bad. You let your mind sit, it'll go bad. You sit down, your, your, your legs will go to sleep. Whatever you, whatever sit, you let a car sit, the battery will die. Whatever sits goes bad. Whatever sits too long, it goes bad. It, you have to keep moving. You have to keep moving. If you want to keep moving, you got to keep moving. The older that we get, I mean, if you want to keep moving, you got to keep, you got to keep moving. You got to keep moving. You got to keep moving. You got to go to another village. You can't live in the hurt of who left you and what happened to you here and let that paralyze you. You've got to keep moving. You got to heal through that. You go through process. You feel the grief of the pain of who broke up with you and now you're by yourself, but you have to learn you can carry your own party with you. Joy is an attitude, and I'm telling you, when you've got the right kind of attitude, you'll draw the right kind of people into your life. They'll recognize you by the garment of praise that you've got on and keep moving, and you keep moving, and you keep moving. Whatever it is, you, you, you keep moving. And I want you to see that the story didn't just end with David just sinning and then now looking up and getting up and washing up and anointing up and dressing up and going to the house of God to worship up and then eating up. David went into his wife again. He moved on. And he gave his wife another child. And that child, his name was Solomon. Out of his greatest pain came his greatest wisdom. You never do know that what you have just gone through that hurt you the most actually leads toward a path of birthing your greatest wisdom. He produced a child that is regarded to this day as the wisest man who ever lived. Because that next baby that Bathsheba gave birth to, because David fixed his life with God, he fixed his heart. And then God graced him to birth a Solomon, the wisest thing that ever lived. He went to another village. He moved on. And unless you let go of what you've been mourning over, you cannot possess the life that is waiting for you. It's time, church, now to move on. Whatever we've been grieving over, whatever we've been hurt over, Whatever we've been salty about, it's time to move on. Move on. I don't know about you, but I'm moving 
on. Don't stay in a low place. Go through your grieving process. Find your safe place with safe people. Talk through it. Cry through it. But make your adjustments and you'll find that that thing is going to lead you ultimately to a path of growth, growth and productivity. And your, great, your greatest wisdom is yet to be born. Your greatest wisdom, your greatest wisdom, your greatest wisdom comes out of your deepest failure. You learn much more from your mistakes than you do from your successes. And that's why some people are so wise is because they've made so many mistakes. And now they're able to help others to benefit from all of the poor choices and the impulsive decisions that they made. But the good news is that you don't have to get stuck where you fall. Look up. Get up. Wash up. Anoint up. Dress up, worship up, and eat up and feed yourself for where you're going. Your Solomon is calling. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.